Good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing tonight? Yeah? Uh, my name is Danielle Yampolsky, and I'm the president of Penn College Republicans. Our mission is to espouse the values of the Republican Party through maintaining strong leadership on campus, building an active and engaging social media presence, and hosting prominent and dialogue-provoking speakers. We also strive to foster a community for conservative students on campus by promoting the values and ideals of personal responsibility, limited government, free market capitalism, and American exceptionalism. In light of free speech and open debate, we are kicking off our first speaker event with a very hot topic, open borders and illegal immigration. Um, because America is undoubtedly the most prosperous nation in, in the world, many people around the world hope to come here and search for a better life. However, it is important not to lose sight of the fact that living in America is a blessing and a privilege and not a right. As a sovereign nation, we have the right to enforce our, board, our borders and control who comes in and out of our nation. It stems from these wild concepts called national security and the rule of law. <laughs> Therefore, um, it is important to keep in mind the difference between legal versus illegal immigration, even though the leftist media does love to conflate the two. Moreover, if any of you all have turned on the, lef the leftist news lately, you would constantly see the left demonizing border patrol agents, calling to abolish ICE, and most recently supporting free taxpayer-funded health care for people who are in this country illegally. You may be wondering, why would anyone support open borders and illegal immigration? Who benefits from this? Hopefully, we can find that out tonight with our guest speaker. So on that note, first and foremost, I would like to thank all of you in the audience for joining us this evening. The fact that you are here tonight listening to a speaker who represents a point of view that is underrepresented on college campuses across the nation means a lot, and I hope that everyone is able to take away something new today. Second, I would like to thank the Claire Booth Luce Center for Conservative, Conservative Women for making this event possible. CBL's mission is to prepare women for effective leadership and to promote leading conservative women. Their materials, programs, and initiatives stress the importance of moral values, strength of character, academic excellence, integrity, and a strong work ethic. Ultimately, by putting forward conservative role models for young women, this helps cease the radical femi feminist monopoly on, um, on important issues and dispel the, the myth that all women must be Democrats. Now, I'm honored to introduce our guest speaker. Michelle Malkin is a mother, wife, blogger, conservative syndicated columnist, longtime cable TV news commentator, and best-selling author of six books. Her latest book and expose, Open Borders, Inc., Who's Funding America's Destruction, just hit shelves last Tuesday. She started her newspaper journalism career at the Los Angeles Daily News in 1992 and has been um, penning nationally syndicated newspaper columns for Creator Syndicate since 1999. She is also the founder of conservative internet startups HotAir.com and Twitchy.com. She, she has received numerous awards for her investigative journalism, including the Council on Governmental Ethics Laws National Award for Outstanding Service for the Cause of Governmental Ethics and Leadership, the Heritage Foundation and Franklin Center for Government and Public Integrity's Breitbart, Breitbart Award for Excellence in Journalism, and the Center for Immigration Studies' Eugene Katz Award for Excellence in Coverage of Immigration. Married for 26 years and the mother of two teenage children, she lives with her family in Colorado. Feel free to follow her at michellemalkin.com. Now, please join me in, wel in welcoming Miss Michelle Malkin. when I go to a college campus. <laughs> so um, I'm going to show my age, but uh, let's see, I think it was 15 years ago, maybe a little less, I was at the home of the free speech movement at UC Berkeley. And the tolerant types there spent the whole hour uh, that I tried to lecture with C-SPAN cameras filming 
beating on the doors that had to be chained. And there were 20, there was a phalanx of 20 security guards plus uh, city of Berkeley police officers for the crime of uh, departing from the usual orthodoxy of that campus. So this is how many of the free speech extremists um, demonstrate their tolerance by trying to drown out the free speech of those with which they disagree. So I'm very thankful that uh, it looks like I'm not going to have to do any <laughs> this. Or... I've, I've been um, lifting lately. So, uh, anyway, uh, of course, institutions of, of higher learning are supposed to be places where we can vigorously disagree, where each and every person on a college campus is supposed to challenge uh, their own pre-existing beliefs and, and narratives, and increasingly that hasn't been true. Certainly in the, the last quarter century, uh, since I graduated from the berserkly of the Midwest, Oberlin College, um, some of you may know that it is the, uh, the breeding ground, the ground zero, uh, that gave birth to the very concept of a safe space. And so when I was a, a college undergrad, I learned early on that safe space is only protected certain classes of, of people. And uh, very early on, um, I was introduced to this radical notion of, of extremist identity politics, that because my skin color looked like this and my eye shape was this, and my parents came from a different country, that somehow uh, one single side of the ideological spectrum owned me. And um, even though I, I grew up as a, a rather docile and obedient model minority Asian American, the fact is I don't like to be owned by anybody. <laughs> And I think that um, what I find promising in American politics is that there are many people like me who feel the same way. And what we've seen is a stifling of ideological dissent on college campuses that should be encouraging it. And the topic of immigration, uh, this existential crisis that America faces because we cannot have a rational discussion about who we should let in, what those numbers should be, what the system should look like in determining how we uh, remove and deport people who don't belong here in the first place. All of those are fraught with such radioactivity. And in large part, it's because one side of the political spectrum has succeeded spectacularly in demonizing the other side. Uh, Open Borders, Inc. is the third in um, what I joked to a, a group of uh, college kids beforehand, uh, before the event, is sort of my Star Wars trilogy. So the very first book I wrote in the aftermath of the 9-11 terrorist attacks was called Invasion, which I have been informed is now a trigger word. <laughs> I, I'm not kidding you. I was advised by uh, a producer that I should not use the word <laughs> I believe it is an accurate description of what has been long occurring at the southern border, and I've visited there many times as a reporter, as a documentarian, as an editorial writer, as a columnist, as a fellow American of so many of the, the ranchers in particular who are under siege there. There has been an invisible war that's been declared at the southern border for a long period of time, an invasion was really a way of connecting the dots between our systemic failures to strictly enforce our immigration laws that protect our sovereignty and how those failures paved a clear and unobstructed path for a small, teeny tiny minority of malefactors, of, of nefarious plotters to commit mass jihad in this country. And again, these are things you're not supposed to talk about, except for the one day when it's the anniversary of September 11th, and then everybody gets to mouth platitudes about how we should never forget. Well, forgetting is, uh, never forgetting is, um, you know, not much use other than a bumper sticker or lit candles that melt, you know, after a couple of hours, if you're not gonna do anything about it, if you're not gonna have any resolve to, um, fix the failures that sacrificed so many innocent people 
in the first place. The second in the, the trilogy of, of immigration books that I did was my fifth book called Sold Out. And I shifted my attention from national security and public safety to economic security um, and questioned the ways in which this unfortunately bipartisan alliance on the left and the right, um, ideologues who uh, do not subscribe to the idea that we should have a sovereign country, uh, radical identity politics, as, as I mentioned already, but allied with big business forces who have an insatiable thirst for uh, cheap labor pipelines and how uh, those pipelines are um, hurting American IT workers in particular. So then we move to this third book, Open Borders, Inc., Who's Funding America's Destruction? And I set out to answer a question that has been asked many times since President Trump took office and the American public has been shown videos and pictures of uh, illegal alien caravans uh, that find their way from Central America up the spine of Mexico into the interior of the country uh, where they are harbored and aided and abetted and sheltered by a number of special interests all along the way. And it was frustrating to appear on cable TV and as many of you know, I've, I've uh, made somewhat of a, a living in that medium for the last 15 years to answer this question in a two minute segment that's really 30 seconds because most of it's taken up by commercial breaks and host monologues. Um, so I'm grateful to my publisher, Regnery, who I came home to. They published four of my first books, including Invasion, uh, and grateful to them that they didn't cut a single page so that I could stuff as much information for readers into these two covers. Nearly 500 pages, all documented, all cited. And I think that probably one of the most dangerous acts one could do is actually read the book rather than believe a lot of the propaganda about the book that has appeared um, since it, it was released last Tuesday. Case in point, in the local Daily Pennsylvania newspaper, and I understand that the journalist, Grant Bianco, is, is here. I don't mean to single you out, but you singled me out. It's OK. No, don't worry. Yes. So um, I did not go to a graduate school in journalism, but I have worked for two daily metropolitan newspapers and made a living in both old and new media for a quarter century. And I always have found it useful to pay the courtesy of contacting the subject of, of a, an article for some sort of reaction before publishing. And um, I'm not hard to find. So for future reference, at Michelle Malkin on Twitter, the right Michelle Malkin on Facebook, uh, michellemalkin.com is my website, which has my email address, and I'll give you my phone number too as well. And I think it's important, especially if you're going to run an article like this, uh, which infers that somehow I hate Jews, that you might want to ask my reaction beforehand. After accusations of anti-Semitism, conservative author Michelle Malkin to speak at Penn. Let me give you a, a, a direct analogy of what an article might look like if you were accused of, say, pedophilia. After accusations of, of pedophilia, Daily Pennsylvanian writer Grant Bianco to attend Michelle Malkin's speech. Mm. So this article is based, I would infer from another article, a reference to something that was posted on a site called Media Matters, which <laughs> conveniently <laughs> highlighted in Open Borders, Inc. as one of the primary, para primary organizations that smears anybody who dares to stray from the orthodoxy on open borders. And this article says, Fox and Friends guest pushes, quote, anti-Semitic conspiracy theory that motivated Tree of Life synagogue shooter. So, not that it needs to be spelled out, but basically what this argue is arguing and what this argue is echoing is that the 500 pages that you see compiled in this book, that not a single one of the Soros operatives has refuted yet, is somehow tantamount to inciting the kind of violence that we all abhor 
that occurred at the Tree of Life synagogue. If you had bothered to contact me for some sort of um, reaction to that smear, I would have informed you that I am the proud wife of the grandson of Ukrainian Jews who came to this country to escape pogroms. I would tell you that I am very close and in love with all of the members of my Jewish family on my father's side, that I have been a proud supporter of Israel, but more importantly, a proud supporter of American sovereignty. And I would have also informed you that you should read the chapters in this book that deal with media matters so that you could understand that it is a grave mistake to rely on such propaganda if you're going to try and debunk my book. And by the way, I'll give you a free copy at the end. talk afterwards, it's my time to talk, okay. okay? You already had your say. So, if you Google anti-Semitic and Michelle Malkin, you will find hundreds and thousands of references that have the cumulative effect of scaring the bejesus out of people into thinking that I'm some sort of hater of Jews and hater of immigrants. I am the child of legal immigrants to this family. I have immigrant family members in this audience now that I love and that I'm incredibly proud of. I am not an immigrant hater. I'm an America lover. And the problem, <laughs> the problem with this entire echo chamber that's been created largely by George Soros, yes, who happens to be of Jewish background, but has, that has nothing to do with why I oppose his agenda. I've actually <coughs> read some of his work, and I quote from a book of his called The Case of Global Governance, and he makes his agenda quite clear. He doesn't believe in the sovereignty of any nation, because to him it is, quote, an obstacle, an obstacle to his goals of controlling westernized, industrialized countries from outside out, our country. It is an agenda that is uh, <coughs> largely driven by the United Nations. It is one that has already led to the indiscriminate redistribution of refugees from around the world, many of them from countries that hate our guts, uh, that send people here who abuse our compassion to exploit our generosity and plot violence within American borders. And there's a, a very alarming appendix that I recommend that all of you take a look at at the end of the book of 60 profiles of refugees who were resettled in this country, a partnership between the United Nations, the State Department, the Health and Human Services Department funded by billions of your tax dollars in partnership with uh, religious organizations that have very lucrative contracts and no accountability when things go wrong. And so 60 of what I call refugihadis, this is just 60 that I identify. I mean, there are probably scores, if not hundreds more, that have never been reported on, um, and untold numbers yet to be caught, of, of people who have uh, been arrested, charged, or convicted of plotting jihad after coming to, into this country, claiming persecution, religious, ethnic, political, or otherwise. And so the same cycle of accusations of xenophobia, racism, anti-Semitism, it's ridiculous. We have the most pro-Israel president in American history every single day being labeled an anti-Semite. It doesn't matter that he's the best friend of Israel. It doesn't matter that he has uh, practicing Jewish members of his own family, including his son-in-law and, and his daughter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter that my brown skin is much darker than yours, my uh, gentleman uh, over there. And, and it makes it impossible to have rational discussions about where this money is coming from, how it's being spent, uh, and who's responsible for sabotaging American sovereignty. Open Society Foundations, which uh, is funded by George Soros, who has, has $25.2 billion net worth, $18 billion of which he is shoveling into the foundations as his legacy, um, 
has created a, this entire network, not only the echo chamber that I'm talking about, the media matters of the world, whose propaganda just gets regurgitated blindly by young people on college campuses that aspire to be journalists, let alone journalists at the New York Times. But it's also a, a, a defamation machine that works in partnership with the likes of the Southern Poverty Law Center. And there's a, an entire chapter uh, in the book talking about exactly these kind of tactics. And they have specifically targeted people who believe that we should have a, an orderly immigration system. And that yes, we should discriminate. And yes, we should be picky about who we let into the country. Back in 2006 and 2007, um, I was targeted by a group called the National Council of La Raza, now known as Unidos US. And they didn't like that I was talking about an academic theory that had uh, burgeoned in the Southwest. I started out my newspaper career in Los Angeles. So many of the fissure lines that we're seeing that led to the election of, of Donald Trump were really beginning to crack in Southern California. Uh, the grassroots movement against uh, the massive costs of illegal immigration imposed um, in Southern California, not just financial, health, education, welfare, cultural. Um, Proposition 187, which was the first grassroots uh, citizens initiative referendum to try and limit those costs. Um, and so I paid attention to what was going on in, in the universities. And uh, there is a, a, a school of thought that the entire Southwest should be reclaimed uh, by Mexico. So they call it the Reconquista movement. Um, they don't consider the Southwest a part of America. They call it Azatlan. And I was trying to explain this academic theory um, and groups like the Brown Berets, which um, are militantly anti-police, uh, anti-border patrol, on a television show. And my name ended up on a hate list. And it turned out that I was invoking code words of hate. Now, I never get the recipe book. You're only told after the fact uh, that you're not allowed to say these words. And, and that very tactic has been used now um, to push any number of immigration enforcement groups, um, social conservatives, Trump supporters, um, off of platforms. There's a direct line that you can connect between what I experienced 13, 14 years ago and what the SPLC is doing now in conjunction with Silicon Valley, unfortunately. And I think one of the most important revelations, um, it might not be a revelation to some of you, but I certainly plumb, it, uh, plumb this uh, topic in, in more depth, is the partnership that exists between the likes of Tim Cook at Apple and Mark Zuckerberg at Facebook and Jack Dorsey at Twitter with the SPLC, which it has invited into its inner chambers to design special algorithms. You never know when you tweet something whether you're going to end up on this list. You could use the phrase illegal alien, another trigger word. Uh, even though it, that, that phrase and, and that concept is embedded in US law, you're not allowed to say it. Um, journalistic colleagues of mine now abide by the Associated Press Handbook, which says that you're not allowed to use that I word either, invasion, illegal. Um, and it is really quite Orwellian or post-Orwellian um, the, the methods that are used to try and stifle debate, the debate on this topic. And so I, I, I felt that it was necessary to single you out uh, and address this tactic because I think it is detrimental. Uh, and what I'm trying to do is have people read the information in the book. And it's impossible to do that if you're smeared as a hate monger from the get-go. I doubt that you've even cracked the book open or, or even read the, the book flap. Am I correct? Um, you are correct. Yes. Thank you. That's pretty typical of most of the mainstream minted journalists. <laughs> it's like a Sorbonne-like click. That's another pet peeve of mine. I've worked for two me metropolitan newspapers. I've founded two 
uh, media corporations that I've sold uh, to other corporate media, but I will never be considered a journalist, in large part now because I have essentially come out of the closet as an activist journalist. If Jorge Ramos is allowed to do it, why can't I? Right. Um, I don't think that uh, being a journalist, as long as I um, acknowledge whatever biases I might have and invite people to um, you know, test the integrity of my work, challenge you to, to uh, vet the facts of it. If I get anything wrong, I will immediately correct it and acknowledge it. That's what good journalists should do. Um, none of us is free from confir confirmation bias, certainly. And, and I think in a lot of ways, confirmation bias is a much bigger problem than uh, partisan bias. In Britain, all of the newspapers label whether they're left or right, and people are allowed to you know, sort of, of understand the transparency there and, and judge it on its own. I wish that the papers would do it here. I think the main problem with media bias here is that the, the pretense of objectivity and neutrality. Come on, CNN, New York Times, the, the latest uh, Kavanaugh fiasco here. Um, and, you know, when they correct things, they make things even worse for themselves because of their hubris. Um, and I think especially with, with approaching a, a topic like immigration, which is so incredibly complex in some ways, but also very simple, some modicum of intellectual humility uh, or honesty about where you're coming from would uh, improve the debate for everybody. One of the, the, the main slants that you see in most of the coverage, and certainly since these caravans started coming up from the southern border in unprecedented numbers, is that the perspective is always told from the downtrodden border trespasser. And it is very rare that you'll get the perspective of Americans or legal immigrants or naturalized Americans or even other members of the so-called migrant community, other illegal alien families who have borne the negative effects of massive open borders and open borders, Inc. It's always President Trump that's getting blamed for the deaths at the border or the children who are uh, in custody in these detention centers when the much larger historical context points to these pull factors, these magnets, and these overwhelming financial incentives that are created by any number of these Soros-subsidized organizations, the tax-exempt nonprofit non charities, the drug cartels, which make billions of dollars, the uh, financial industry, our banks, every single one of them, which operates a remittance program uh, and pays and, and charges a, uh, you know, huge um, premiums for illegal alien workers to send money back home. Um, I pointed out that even the Federal Reserve runs a remittance program and recruits illegal alien uh, customers. Um, I found a program that was doing this in, in Minnesota. And there's a, this incredible cognitive dissonance because we have every one of these Democratic presidential candidates saying they want higher wages for American workers while they support the massive influx of low wage workers uh, who are suppressing those wages for um, Americans. Um, we have Democrats who are always talking about the homeless problem in Democrat run <laughs> cities. Who's, who's to blame for that? Um, we've got homeless veterans on the streets in need of help. We have American families who are being separated permanently from their loved ones because of sanctuary cities, counties, and states. Speaking of sanctuaries, I was looking at the announcement of the University of Pennsylvania in 2016 and its rather militant um, statement about being a sanctuary. I don't want to read this. I'm sure some of you know this, maybe some of you don't. The University of Pennsylvania will not allow immigration and customs enforcement or customs and border protection or US citizenship and immigration services on our campus unless required by warrant. Further, the university will not share any information 
about any undocumented student with these agencies unless presented with valid legal process. Essentially conferring Fourth Amendment rights to illegal aliens and effectively granting more rights to illegal alien students on campus than American citizens have. And I understand that there may be good intentions involved behind uh, such a move. But the fact is that sanctuary policies all across the country have made every single resident of this country more unsafe. Because once again, what you're doing are constructing these walls uh, that block communication between federal immigration agents and everybody else. And we saw what happened on 9-11 when that happened. There were uh, local police officers and Maryland state troopers that had uh, stopped some of the 9-11 hijackers who were speeding through Maryland. There was no system in place uh, to check what their immigration status was, and five of those 19 hijackers were visa overstayers. We often forget in the larger context of, of focusing on the southern border that nearly 40% of, of the people who are here illegally have overstayed their visas, and they're from places around the world, whether they're from <coughs> Saudi Arabia or Asia or Africa or Eastern Europe. They're not supposed to be here. And this is part of the reason why strict immigration enforcement uh, benefits everybody. Because among the now massive population of nearly 700,000 <laughs> visa overstayers are untold numbers of people who are not just here to improve their lives or better their lot. Um, you know, they have much uh, darker goals in mind, and it is not a conspiracy theory to say so. Um, you look at a place like the <coughs> Twin Cities in Minneapolis, um, which has become what law enforcement and uh, DH officials call the terror recruitment capital of the world. Uh, and it is a textbook case of the good intentions of refugee resettlement gone wrong. The Trump administration is now considering um, either freezing or reducing the refugee numbers down to close to zero from an all-time high under the Obama administration of 100,000. Does that make us cruel? Does that make us inhumane? Does that make us stingy? No. We still remain uh, the most generous, overly generous and compassionate nation in the world when it comes to welcoming people. We welcome one million new green card holders every single year. Um, that's on top of all of the nearly 30, upwards of 30 million people who are here illegally, who in many ways are able to operate out of the shadows. They certainly are able and, and welcome to do so here at the University of Pennsylvania. And many of the, of the elite college campuses advertise that on their shingles as a bragging right. Uh, in Montgomery County, Maryland, which I uh, just came from and where I used to live, Illegal aliens can get driver's licenses. Um, in many localities, they're allowed to vote in school board elections. They're allowed to do so in San Francisco as well. They get in-state tuition discounts. Uh, and when Obama um, passed by executive order the so-called um, Dreamer amnesty, it's not just that uh, they were given a shield from deportation. Um, hundreds of thousands of people were also given work permits as well. Um, there are limits to the amount of compassion that any sovereign nation must enforce before um, that sovereignty completely dissipates. And the core warning of Open Borders, Inc. is in following the money trail and realizing that individual citizens may be unknowingly and unwittingly enabling uh, Open Borders, Inc. There's a lot that's in the book that was very uncomfortable to report. And I, I think that's one of the things that the Soros minions uh, would rather uh, not have readers or listeners of my radio or TV interviewers understand. To me, there's no le stone left unturned. Whether that means criticizing the left 
criticizing the US Chamber of Commerce on the right, the Koch Institute and the Koch brothers, um, many establishment GOP swampy types who are cashing in on uh, many of these pipelines. And I'm speaking as somebody uh, who's been a you know, proud conservative uh, most of her life, uh, has only ever not voted for Republican once in 1996 when I voted for the libertarian Harry Brown. That's public knowledge. Um, and, and it is actually, I think, even more important uh, to expose when uh, people on who I, I believe to have been on my side are actually aiding and abetting you know, the, the easier enemies to, uh, to target. And it was also uncomfortable, of course, to shine a light, as I did in a chapter on uh, the Catholic Church. I was baptized Catholic. I was raised Catholic. Uh, I went to a Catholic high school, um, kids baptized. And um, unfortunately, we have a pope who is not just suffering from Trump derangement syndrome, um, but who has helped uh, fuel and stand up an entire um, network of shelters that run from Central America all the way up through Mexico, and again are inducing and incentivizing people to do incredibly dangerous things. I think that enforcement is actually the most compassionate policy because the most compassionate thing that we could do is discourage people from risking their lives or paying coyotes or enriching the drug cartels uh, to um, have you know, complete strangers who are, who are endangering their relatives, particularly children, um, and dragging them across the desert. This is not Donald <laughs> Trump's fault that we have this. We have coyotes and all sorts of operators that advertise in the poorest towns in Central America that if you can make it to the border, all you have to do is come up with some manufactured story of persecution and turn yourself in at the nearest border patrol station. Okay, people don't understand if you've not been to the border. It's not as if people are trying to evade uh, enforcement. We now have a border patrol that has been essentially turned into a diaper patrol to meet the humanitarian needs of people at the border um, because of this inducing. And it wasn't until very recently, I guess better late than never, that the Trump administration realized that in order to stop this, this massive inflow, which is endangering everyone, because if you've got the Border Patrol distracted, having to serve the humanitarian needs of all these people rather than going after drug cartels or violent human traffickers, um, that, that it was going to cause even more anarchy and, and suffering. And so to turn off that magnet, they had to stop this catch and release policy, which has been in place as a result of something called the Flores Settlement. This is not law. It was not voted on by Congress. It was a Clinton judge and many of these lawyers' lobbies that are subsidized by the likes of Soros and the Tides Foundation that decided that uh, anybody who was a minor or with a minor had to be uh, released within a short amount of time. So we have had border apprehensions drop recently, but it's a drop in the bucket um, compared to what we've seen over the last three years or 10 years or 15 years. And once those magnets, magnets are turned off, if the, the home countries that are profiting from this and that are relieved of their duty and, and responsibility to their own citizens finally have to reckon with improving their countries, this is good for everybody. Um, but unfortunately, to, to talk about such practical things will, again, invite uh, you know, attacks that somehow I hate brown people. I can't, no, I don't hate brown people. Um, and this is, it's a problem that preceded uh, Trump. It, it is a, an intractable problem that will uh, last, unfortunately, long after. And I think it's also important to note, um, when we're tracing all this funding as well, that we also remain the most generous in granting foreign aid to all of these countries. 
And perhaps it would behoove the citizens in those countries to demand of their leaders to know what happened to all of these billions of dollars in foreign aid, largely from the United States, over the last 20, 25 years. Um, so we've talked about the war on our sovereignty, the war on our borders, and the intersection of all of that with the war on free speech. Um, I do want to come back to talking about college campuses because um, this problem is in your own backyards. Philadelphia is a uh, sanctuary city, essentially. This is a sanctuary campus. And when you have the demonization of critics like myself or other fellow professors who speak up about this, um, it is especially dangerous from the point of free speech and free inquiry. And it is also a, a physical threat. I mean, it is not fun to have to worry about security when you're going to speak on a college campus. A college campus should be the safest place to be able to discuss dangerous ideas. And so inside and outside of this campus now, you have the growing threat of what I call the A-team. Antifa, abolish ICE, and the sanctuary anarchists. And when there are good people and patriots who are willing to stand up to the slings and arrows, uh, or even have to be out on the streets and fight back, uh, it is very daunting when you have a city elite and a college campus administrative elite uh, who are ready not only to smear those dissenters and, the, and unorthodox free thinkers, but who are also willing to put them in jail. One of the people who blurbed my book is a very good friend of mine who is the furthest thing from a hater or a xenophobe or a racist, and his name is Gavin McInnes. He's the co-founder of Vice, and he is the founder of the Proud Boys. Um, and several of, of uh, those Proud Boys in Pennsylvania have been selectively and unjustly prosecuted for defending themselves and defending their country. I just have to, to read the blurb for you. Most people get blurbs from like really famous people and hope that they'll get on their TV shows. And I picked people to uh, endorse my book who've been banned or censored in some way. And I call them members of the valley of the band. Gavin is banned on Facebook. He has a, a show called Free Speech TV where he talks to people all across the spectrum. I was privileged to do a debate with Michael Eric Dyson. Yes, uh, you know, a far left professor who sat down with me and we had a fascinating conversation about uh, the criminal justice system. That's what should be happening on college campuses. But Gavin cannot post on Twitter or Facebook. And in fact, I posted a picture, just a mere peaceful little picture, pixels, on my Facebook, and Facebook banned it because it constituted hate speech. He wrote, Michelle Malkin is not a pretty little <coughs> Filipino girl. That's just what she looks like. Her personality is more like Charles Bronson in Death Wish. That is true. <laughs> when the alt-left's chant of no borders, no wall, no USA at all went mainstream, Michelle went ballistic, and this book is a veritable fireball of finely tuned arguments that beautifully counter the new wave of anti-Americanism. If any book could save America from itself, this is it. I didn't pay him, that's so lovely. Um, the, the, the point is that uh, when people like Gavin are systematically picked off and deplatformed, it, um, it makes me fear for this country. I have enjoyed more than 25 years being able to make a living exercising the First Amendment and running my big brown mouth. That is the epitome of the American dream. And when I established a foothold and planted my flag in new media in 2004, officially is when I started my first blog, it never <coughs> occurred to me that I might wake up one day and my blog just be completely unplugged because of, of the content, because of my political views, because of my uh, policy agenda. But as I was putting the book to bed before it went to the printer in August, a friend of mine whose work is copiously cited in this book, Ann Corcoran, who, runs, who ran 
uh, a tremendous citizen investigative blog called Refugee Resettlement Watch had her blog, which was hosted by um, a platform called WordPress. By the way, that's the same platform that my blog has been on for 15 years. Had the, the blog completely killed. Her entire archives, 10, 11 years worth of original investigative research, just like that. What did she do that was such a crime? Mostly she looked up uh, IRS forms of nonprofits. She tracked stories of crime in um, <coughs> neighborhoods that have become refugee resettlement zones. Uh, she posted things like maps from the State Department, one of which I reprinted in the book to show people where the vast majority of refugees have been resettled. A lot of people don't even know that this has happened in their backyards. We know about the Twin Cities. We know about sort of the larger metropolitan areas where uh, refugees are, are much more visible. But in places like Lewiston, Maine, and uh, Twin Falls, Idaho, and Franklin, Tennessee, um, the local citizens there have little to no input about uh, these monopoly government contractors, the US Conference of Catholic Bishops, uh, the Lutheran Immigrant and Refugee Services, which brought Ilan Omar to Minnesota, um, uh, the Hebrew Aid Society, um, Church World Services. And they're working in conjunction with these larger transnational entities, ignoring the fact that, that US law actually requires them to get local input. And so what Ann Corcoran was doing was encouraging what she called pockets of resistance, the other resistance, the resistance on, on behalf of America. And she was having some success. And apparently, that's verboten. That is not allowed. And um, she was able to retrieve her archives. She's slowly trying to rebuild uh, that website. Um, and she has another one. but. Um, when that happened, right before I finalized the manuscript, it confirmed for me the urgency of uh, finishing this book and doing the tour that I'm doing. Um, as some of you, you know, I'm specifically targeting sanctuary cities. Uh, on Labor Day, I was in my adopted home state in Colorado, and um, 200 other citizens from grassroots groups joined me at a Stand With Ice rally in front of the Aurora Ice facility, where many of the groups that I talk about in the book had laid siege to that facility, which detains a, a large number of criminal illegal aliens, repeat drunk drivers, rapists, murderers. Um, and for doing their jobs, they were targeted. And the American flag was torn down by these protesters, replaced with a Mexican flag, as well as a defaced Blue Lives Matter flag. There had been no answer to that uh, incitement to violence in almost two months. And one of the things that I've always tried to do is practice what I preach. Part of the motivation of going on tour with this book is not just to sell a product. This is not just sort of some sort of your usual vanity book. I wrote it because I'm hoping that people will digest it, share it, and then take action on it. Because I really, truly believe that we are at a, a crisis point in this country, and we need to get up off the sidelines. I did the same thing on Friday in Montgomery County, where I used to live, another ground zero in the battle against illegal alien sanctuary spaces. And the sanctuary there is perhaps the most extreme in the country because the county executive and council there um, voted to forbid ICE agents even from entering county jails to conduct criminal investigations. They now require county employees to give illegal alien detainees a 48-hour heads up if ICE inquires about their immigration status, basically giving them a run notice. Uh, conspiring with them to sabotage our laws. And it's as if they've just completely ob obliterated um, Chapter 8 of the US Code, 
Section 1324, which forbids the aiding, abetting, harboring, and sheltering of illegal aliens, let alone the employment of such, and especially when we're dealing with illegal aliens who are, as my not friend Geraldo Rivera says, otherwise law-abiding. I mean, all you have to do is look at the case of Ilan Omar to realize that otherwise law-abiding is a joke. She is somebody who should be investigated not only for immigration fraud, but tax fraud, marriage fraud, and student aid fraud, otherwise law-abiding. <laughs> So I've dumped a lot on you. And my, my message is really, for those of you who are sort of already agree, who are kind of um, have seen the light and are, may I use an overly used word, woke <laughs> on such matters. I know I can hear my kids groaning, mom, you did not say woke. Um, to, to have courage, um, to not be afraid, and to not believe that all is lost. Um, we, do, we still do have the ability to speak. I'm doing it now. I'm live streaming it on Twitter. I don't know if it's going to be shadow banned. It probably will. But uh, it will get out there some way, <coughs> somehow. You know, the, so the Soviet Union had a samizdat, an underground um, methods of sharing information when they um, had to do so secretly. I'm, fortunately, we don't have to resort to that yet, although I, I will have to say that I, I, I understand that a lot of you in this room have felt that you had to either keep your views to yourself, especially when you know, you're trying to get good grades and get a good job. Everything's a cost-benefit analysis of, of knowing when to fight and knowing when to stay on the sidelines. For me, for my time, yes, I, like I said, I am an activist journalist now. Um, and I proudly wear that label, um, and I'll do everything that I can as long as I have the platforms that I do, uh, and the First Amendment to um, push these issues. Uh, I'm not ready to just give up and, and uh, you know, move somewhere else. I, I still do think we live on the greatest country, in the greatest country on, on the planet. Yes, I am an ist, I'm an American uh, exceptionalist. <coughs> That's what I am. I'm not a, I'm, I, I am an extremist, I suppose, in that matter, and I embrace that label as well. And for those of you who are on the other side of, of this issue, I just want to thank you for not throwing anything at me or anybody else, uh, and for listening. And I will take uh, any questions out there. Thank you very much. Okay, lay them on me. Yeah. So, what is the Trump administration doing to fight these uh, municipalities and counties that are, you know, with illegal immigration, etc., allowing ICE not to detain people? So, there are a number of cases that I talk about in the book litigating the sanctuary issue, and they're all bollocked up in both the lower courts and at the Supreme Court level. Uh, there has always been yammering by the Republican Party that they they're going to defund. Um, many of these municipalities and, and jurisdictions, but it actually hasn't ever happened. I think from a, from a political standpoint point and from an optics standpoint, it would be great if there was at least one Republican, elected Republican, in the swamp who every night would take to the floor for a one-minute speech in front of C-SPAN and make it an issue. Um, in Montgomery County, you know, at least the local press there and some of the conservative press is talking about the the actual impact that the sanctuary order has had there. Eight illegal alien rape suspects who had been turned around in that revolving door uh, caught. And one thing you'll notice about that coverage is it's silent about the nationality, ethnicity, or status of the victims. I lived in Germantown, Maryland, where two of those suspects, three actually, committed their crimes. A 16-year-old girl was allegedly raped as she slept in her townhome in Germantown. That was my first uh, home, was in, a, in an affordable neighborhood like that in Germantown. The, an 11-year-old girl was gang raped by two repeat offenders, one who had already been issued a final order of deportation to be removed, or uh, ignored that, uh, and had been traipsing back across the border multiple times. 
Why do you think we know that information? It's because the police are upset. They're the only ones who know it because the county doesn't keep any statistics on it. They're the ones leaking it because they're so frustrated that they have their hands tied behind their backs. Uh, you know, the one thing that I will give credit to um, for the left is they are great at message control. They know how to repeat and repeat and repeat and repeat. And I think that essentially we have, you know, I don't know if it's just sort of a distraction a day or, you know, we always have to be on the defensive. But what Republicans need to be is, get to, is to get on the offensive. The polls are already with us. The vast majority of Americans, whatever their, their uh, partisan affiliation are, don't want sanctuary jurisdictions. They don't want open borders. And yet every single last Democratic presidential candidate, with the possible uh, exception of Tulsi Gabbard, marches lockstep with the abolished ICE radicals. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my question is, I ran for mayor of Philadelphia as a Republican. You did? I tried. Good for you. The <laughs> 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 here didn't want to see me carry this message. I hear so you. My question is, the first thing that I did was write an um, executive order on this uh, sanctuary city policy. Mm -hmm. Nowhere in here does the words illegal alien Reside. Yeah. Um, and my, my question is the, the way that they have hijacked the language, mm -hmm. like how can we counteract that? Because that I found that to be so problematic. Like this language is here, like it's not even saying, like you know how they always say that we, we are against um, elk, uh, immigrants. Right, right. But we're actually against illegal immigrants. Like if their language has been removed and that's what people are seeing, how do we fight that? Yeah, so my, and, and by the way, thank you for stepping up. Right? Still, yes, good for you. Nowhere. All right. <laughs> I need, I need to... Daphne Goggins. Are you on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook? How do we find you? Okay. Daphne, I'm Daphne Jenkins Goggins on Facebook. Okay. I'm very lively page. Okay. Well, you've just been uh, streamed to my two million. So say hi. I've been there, done that. All right. Yeah, right. Um, so my approach has been to expose the groups that are behind the, the uh, policing of speech. So that we know that groups that have these anodyne names like Hope Not Hate, which is the European counterpart to the Southern Poverty Law Center, are behind the you know, collusion with Silicon Valley to erase accuracy in language. And so I, I don't bend to them. Like, don't bend to the censors in your own speech. Call them out when it's clear exactly what they mean in those kinds of executive orders. And they're very clever about it. Again, I have to give them credit. They understand the, the power of, of language. Um, but I also think supporting um, many of the targets of these censors is important. And I talk about some of the important ca court cases, um, litigation against the Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, the Council on American Islamic Relations, and my friends Gavin McInnes and Laura Loomer are, um, have uh, crowdsourced uh, a lot of litigation funding for that. Um, we got to support the people whose voices are being robbed. Uh, and I think that act in and of itself is pushing back against the hijacking of language. How are, you, how are you handicapping the, uh, the Democratic primary right now for president? They're handicapping themselves. I don't have to do that. <laughs> but but I, I do have to say, yeah, I do have to say it is astonishing that in a country of nearly 350 million people, that there isn't a single person who self identifies as a Democrat who sees. You know, not just whether, you know, not just being right on this issue, right? Not just being with where the polls are, but can actually see the political advantage that they might have because in this entire clown car of, of Democrat candidates, there isn't a single one to say, again, like I say, with the possible exception of Tulsi Gabbard, to say, you know, yeah, I'm not for throwing the, the borders completely wide open. Yeah, that's not a good idea. Interestingly, and I do highlight in the book, there are a number of Democrat mayors in some of these towns that have been overwhelmed by uh, unassimilable refugees um, who have been willing to speak out. Uh, some New England mayors, 
some mayors in working class cities in, in northern New Jersey, for example, who actually rose up in opposition to the Obama State Department and said, look, we've got enough. We've got a lot of problems. We didn't sign up for this. Um, some of those mayors ought to um, have tossed their, their hat into the ring. Um, but the, the radicalization of the Democrat mainstream and their alliance with many of these uh, increasingly violent groups like Abolish ICE or, or Antifa is going to come back to bite them, um, I think. And uh, uh, I've, I've talked about this before, and it's in, even in the preface of my book. Uh, a friend of mine, Andy No, who's a, an independent journalist in Portland who was beaten bloody by these Antifa thugs uh, in Portland, which has also been hijacked by uh, the Occupy ICE forces, I think really was a moment for people. And they, they understand that uh, there's nothing peaceful about these so-called peaceful protesters that are embraced by the Democrat Party. Yeah. Why is the left so pro-legal immigration? And yeah, I mean, like, what's your opinion on that? Why do they keep supporting it, even though there's so much evidence that like backs the the notion that we need to like control immigration. Yeah. So one of one I already illuminated, right? The, the the sort of transnationalist faction doesn't believe in American sovereignty mm -hmm. at all. I mean that's that's fundamentally it. Then there's financial motives, and then I think radical identity politics. And um, I, I, you know, you're all on a college campus. You understand the the um, concept of intersectionality. <laughs> I just have to say it. That's an I word that is allowed. Uh, you know, they, they, that even if it may not be in the particular self-interest of one group on the left, they sort of understand collectively that they should all stand together um, to undermine the, the foundations of our, of our country. And that's why you have, uh, I mentioned this in the book, um, it, was, it, it was interesting to me to see a group called Asata's Daughters. And of course, Asata Shakur is a a uh, fugitive convicted cop killer. She's in Cuba now. And, and so the intellectual heirs, I guess, of her movement coming out of the Black Liberation Army and the Weather Underground, you know, just very uh, violently anti-cop, have allied with groups like United We Dream, um, Unidos US, that, like I talked about, Make the Road New York, uh, which protested the, the travel ban in airports across the country. And you think, wait a minute. Is it really in the interest of, of African Americans to crusade for massive illegal immigration? If you're going to talk about, you know, the impact on wages and you know what's what happened to say South Central Los Angeles uh, as a result, which is a good textbook study. It's like no, it's not in their interest, but they sort of see the the sort of larger collective resistance, uh, you know, to all ideas that are classically Western, um, and so they'll sort of uh, sacrifice, you know, whatever, short-term losses for a larger ideological movement gain. You're waking up. Yeah. Let's see. All the way in the back. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, I have a slightly personal question. You don't have to answer if you don't want. Uh, oh, okay. Why did the Blaze TV deplatform you and Gavin? <sighs> yeah. That is a person. Well, it's not so much a personal question. Well, as no, like a, it's, it's a question business question. Um, I, I, I am very proud of the work that I did at CR. And in fact, you can watch every episode of the, the documentary series I did, Michelle Malkin Investigates, now carried on Newsmax every Wednesday and Saturday. Um, I have a lot of, of friends and colleagues that I respect there, but I did voluntarily leave when the merger was announced. And I wish them well, as they say. Uh, like your uh, husband's family, I was born in Ukraine too. Yes. They, they call us Russian Jew up there. Yes, yes. So when you said time is done, nobody understood that word up here by but me. Yes. I know what does it mean very. So you probably five one, a little tiny beautiful lady. And, uh, <laughs> Thank you. Constantly you got attacked, like we have. Um, leftist uh, cheap shot guy up there. <laughs> so, uh, and at the same time, you are a nightmare for that who want to argue with you. They're afraid of you. They don't want to fight with you. 
My great question for you, where did you find that to being so fearless, powerful? Where do you find that three oh, <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I really am a teddy bear. <laughs> Cheap shot guy. No, we don't look. I don't, you know, I, 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 I want you to come away feeling that this was a positive experience for you. I hope you learn from it, um, particularly if you do want to go into journalism. Uh, even if you, I, I don't know what your views are, but, you know, it, it, it's hard not to infer from the slant of, of the piece. And I will give you a a minute at the end to to respond because I'm I'm for equal time. That's equal. Thank you. Uh, but not right now uh, <laughs> because I just want to finish it, finish your question. I I attribute it to my parents and my family, and I've always said that um, you know they've always made it clear to me what a privilege it is to be here, and it's something that I never want to squander. Um, I don't want to waste a moment um, in this country or you know, in this life or on this earth. And I know it sounds, you know, probably, you know, kind of mushy or whatnot, um, but it is a blessing to be here. And especially for anybody who's had to the privilege of being able to travel around the world, boy, does that give you perspective on, on how grateful um, you should be for, for, for what we have here. And I always thought, it is, it is, amen. And, you know, privilege has become such a toxic word now. Privilege, privilege. We're always supposed to apologize for it. I think the problem is that people don't um, show gratitude enough for it. I'm thankful for the privileges that have been given to me. And those privileges stem from the sacrifices of those who came before, you know, whether it was my parents and my family or our founding fathers. Okay, cheap shot guy. <laughs> Go ahead. All right. Um... So I just want to clarify quickly that the reason I did not reach out to you is, as a student journalist, I, like, uh, we don't, if we're being 100% blunt, we don't, um, we don't normally reach out to very high profile people. Like every time we run a story on President Trump, we don't ask the White House for a comment. We don't have that contact person. As a person with 2 million Twitter followers, um, you're obviously a very high profile figure. If I knew you were willing to comment for the piece, I would have gladly reached out to you. I reached out to the communications director of College Republicans. I reached out to the uh, Claire Booth Center, even though they did not respond. Because they were busy putting on this event. <laughs> but I, like, I'm coming here, so yeah, yeah no, I understand. I would just like to clarify for everyone that the article dealt with allegations and not accusations. I, with all due respect, Ms. Malkin, I did not accuse you, I merely reported that there were allegations. So I, I'm, I'm sure you're deluded into thinking that that, that's, that that was the impact of the piece. But when you rely on Media Matters as your primary source for the accusations, you might think to yourself uh, as an ethical responsibility of determining the truth or, or falsehood of such allegations because of the impact on them. And, I, and I'm standing here before you, and I, I want you to understand this. You know, for me, I can laugh it off because I've had 25 plus years of people calling me a xenophobe, an anti-immigrant, far worse, by the way. In my 2006 book, Unhinged, I have an entire uh, compendium of the most vile accusations that have been made against me. And you also have to see how you are being used as a cog in the machine. If you see the amplification of one single baseless smear, and you are part of that now. Do you, do you understand that? Anytime somebody Googles my name and the title of my book, accusations, and like the mere, the mere framing of it, after accusations of anti-Semitism, conservative author Michelle Mulga to speak at Penn, that's fear mongering, right? I mean, we're lucky that, that, that there aren't uh, violence intending people at this thing. But th this, this is emotional propaganda is what it is. So do, 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 not, do not think to yourself, oh, well, this is a legitimate piece of journalism because I reached out to the other side. Okay, and it should be a pro forma thing, whether it's the White House, you can email the White House press office, or, or me, who is like completely accessible and transparent. <laughs>
So the next time you have a high profile conservative speaker who's coming to this campus, which hopefully others will do and not be dissuaded by things like this beforehand, yes, reach out to them and ask them for comment beforehand. That's the least you could do. Yeah? Okay, yes, ma'am. Uh, what is your opinion on the border wall? So uh, I believe in systemic immigration enforcement. And when I came out with invasion, I talked about all the ways in which we were endangered. And physical obstructions <coughs> along the 2,000 mile uh, border on, on the south is just the start. Um, if they're strategically placed, they could do uh, a heck of, of a lot of good. And we're getting much farther along now than we have been for the last 25 years. But we shouldn't neglect other ports of entry. And when I worked in Seattle in the Pacific Northwest, I dealt with Border Patrol officials and very frustrated customs agents who um, showed me pictures where, like for 100 mile swaths of the northern border, all that protected us was orange rubber cones. <laughs> this is a problem when you have an open borders liberal ideologue uh, at the time, it, it was, I can't remember who was prime minister then, um, well, another Trudeau. Um, but this Trudeau, who's throwing his own country open to the world, um, in fact, wanting to have the most refugees um, resettled in his country, many of them who unfortunately happen to be explicit members of Hamas or Hezbollah, who can just traipse across the, the northern border at, at will. Um, and then we have the problem of visa overstayers, which I talked about. Uh, and then the problem, of course, with um, people who come here legally, if they're coming on short-term visas like business or student or tourist visas, is if they're not vetted properly in our consulates overseas, then they're also just walking through the front door. People forget that all 19 of the Saudi hijackers got their visas through something called the Visa Express Program. We did not want to inconvenience wealthy Saudis and have them standing in the hot sun in line at the consulate. So we basically had drive-through visas that were just rubber stamped. How'd that work out for us? Um, I was recently down at the border to look at privately constructed um, wall. There's a group called We Build the Wall. And it's amazing what they were able to do in, in I think, like less than a week's time. Uh, and in fact, now the Border Patrol uses, uh, they've got a platform where, where they can see all of, of the, the border in, you know, from El Paso. Um, and so, you know, if we have to resort to do it yourself, whatever it takes. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes, sir, over here. Uh, so how strict um, is the deportation system and uh, how lenient is the appeal system for uh, citizenship? Um, say the second half of the question. How lenient is the appeal system for citizenship for, I say, illegal immigrants? So in other words, if somebody is, is uh, here illegally and then they want to adjust their status if they stay long enough and there's amnesty, well, obviously the first one was in 1986 um, under Reagan. Uh, and there was bipartisan agreement that we should have a one-time blanket pardon for everyone here. And then the second half of the bargain was supposed to be, then we'd get full enforcement. We'd get full enforcement of employer sanctions. We'd have a biometric entry exit system. This has been promised since way before uh, September 11th. Um, and, uh, and then there was supposed to be more you know, physical barriers built on the southern border. So we got one part of the bar bargain, but not the other. And in the intervening years between 1986 and 2001, when the terrorist attacks happened, there were 13 other types of amnesties that have been um, adopted for any number of special interests groups. And there's a lot of other programs that allow people who may have broken the law um, to obtain other types of adjustments of statuses. There's the 245I program. There's uh, deferred enforced departure. There's uh, temporary protective status, which is actually being debated in Congress right now. Anytime there's a natural disaster or if there's political turmoil, um, we tend to show, again, just very um, overly uh, generous 
um, compassion for people who are, are here illegally. And then we say, well, it's temporary. It we'll revoke it at some point, and then we never do. And I think that that sort of bureaucratic reality gets blurred when you have all of these radical Democrats um, basically portraying us as uh, as betraying the, the Statue of Liberty, as if the Statue of Liberty has supplanted the US Constitution. Um, and so the first part of your question was about the deportation system. It's a mess. Um, I actually testified before Congress in 2003 on the deportation abyss. And again, this reality, I think, is it's a good check against the, the propaganda that you hear. Because for anybody who is actually involved in the immigration system in any matter, whether they're a consultant or whether they're a lawyer, uh, there's all sorts of loopholes. There's all sorts of ways to play the game to evade deportation. Do you remember Obama had an aunt who was in Boston? Her name was Zaituni Onyango. She was here for 25 plus years. She had been issued multiple orders of deportation. Not only was she allowed to stay here until she died a couple of years ago, she was on welfare in, in, in Boston. She never had a job for the entire quarter century that she was here. Um, and I think that that's, again, you know, people will say, oh, well, that's just one anecdote. Well, OK, no, actually, I have hundreds of thousands of those. Um, and that's just one aspect of it. I mean, asylum has become a complete joke. And to me, what's alarming is that most people around the world know way more about our immigration laws and how to game them than American citizens do. Uh, let's see, yes, over there. Yeah. Uh, my name is Aaron Harun Bashir. So I'll be a candidate for uh, the District 172 Pennsylvania for the House of Representatives. I just wanted to thank you for being so bold and bringing like, you know, important issues on the table. And especially, I just wanted to relate with the word jihad. I come from Pakistan. I was born there and I was raised there. So many people really don't understand the mindset of a lot of people who hate Americans. So now, since I was born in that country, I always saw those uh, wall talking like death to America and like, you know, we hate Americans, they're infidels and blah, blah, blah. But uh, as free thinkers, and as like uh, conservatives, this is what my insight is that we should never, never be so naive. We should let people, you know, uh, in, but we should let them in by the legal ways. Like I myself come from an immigrant family. It took my uncle 16 years to come to the United States. It took seven years for my mother to come here, like when I applied for her. And it's good in a sense that, uh, you know, they become part of melting pot before they came and we were able to, like, you know, set up all the financial grounds for them. But when the illegal immigrants, like people who hate America and who come with a mentality of jihad to destroy us and to wage a war against us, we shouldn't be naive, we should be logical, we should be people of rationale saying, hey, here is the wall, you can't come in here. So we, that's why we all are like, like, Michelle, I agree with you, we should be against illegal immigration. But on the other side, when people are just, you know, showing us only one side of the picture that, oh, we are not compassionate, we are not human. No, no, that's not the true case. We also are immigrants. We also came from those generations, but we are people of logic as well. For instance, this is the last example, I, I will just take one minute. I'm a father of three children. I will never open a door for a stranger or for a homeless person to come and uh, you know, spend the night with my family because I don't know him. When I'm sleeping in the night time, what if he stares my family? I will be nice as a strong conservative Christian. I will feed him, I will give him clothes, I will do everything. But if I don't know that guy, I would not let him inside my house. And this country is like our home. We cannot trust, we cannot bring in those people. Like, you know, we don't have the trust. We don't know what kind of people they are and what they would do. And you already have the facts. They, a lot of them, they have done the illegal stuff. Murders, rapes, and, you know, terrorism. So we cannot afford them. Thank you so much for coming and becoming so bold. Thank, Thank you. you. Good luck with your campaign.
everything you said made sense. You said it eloquently. You said it compassionately. And now you are my fellow white nationalist. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It is very disappointing to me that there's not emphasis on how undemocratic the Democrats' position on immigration is. They want to completely ignore our immigration laws. They're always accusing the other side of undermining democracy. But to erase the distinction between legal and illegal, which is in our law, it is in our laws, is completely undemocratic. These are democratically enacted laws. They represent the will of the people. So I, I just ask you, why is there not a constant hammering on that point that the Democrats are the least democratic party out there? They are flouting the will of the people in their position on immigration. You're absolutely right. I wish you could be press secretary. <laughs> I, I think that there should be a laser focus exactly on that point. It, this is about the subversion of democracy. And that goes to what I was saying about George Soros wanting to undermine our sovereignty. And so you have the hijacking of any sense of local control over a community, whether it's the refugee resettlement program, whether it's MS-13 infiltrating local public schools. If I had not made the decision to move out of Montgomery County 11 years ago, that could have been my kids in, in a public school system. And these are afford supposedly affordable neighborhoods. Um, there, there's no uh, referenda. I mean, well, you know, you had Prop 187 in California. You had SB 1070 in Arizona. And what were the forces that were opposing them? You had multiple foreign countries signing on, uh, on amicus briefs that took SB 1070 all the way to the Supreme Court. You've got this illegal alien lawyers lobby now that is representing illegal aliens all the way up to the Supreme Court to sue for everything from subsidized abortions for teenagers coming across illegally to employment benefits um, for, for illegal aliens. Uh, it is mind boggling. And I think especially leading up to the, the next um, uh, election, day, and we're in the middle of that cycle, that exactly that point should be stressed. So thank you. Yes, over here. Philadelphia has, has not uh, been under Republican rule since 1952. And unfortunately, we've been given a, a horrible gift from Soros in our district attorney, Larry Krasner. Larry Krasner, yes, yes. <laughs> not, well, I'm glad you have it, but basically what what can be done and and, and Ms. Gaines, i salute you for running i supported you uh, but but what can be done to kind of change the to to just change the mindset in this town and kind of see like how insidious that larry krasner is and the current administration in this town yeah so when you have visible and visceral stories of victims who have suffered because of his policies, like in, in Montgomery County now, we can point to these cases that were the direct result. There's a direct nexus between Open Borders, Inc. and the endangerment of the public. Those stories have to be elevated, and you can't rely on the Philadelphia Inquirer nope. to do it. And that is what the, you know, the, the leveraging of alternate media, such that it exists here, uh, talk radio, hosts. I mean, in, in a way, that's, that's our samistat, right? Uh, and, 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 and so you need both. You need people who are willing to run for office. Uh, and those people need to be supported. And their names need to be elevated because, again, it's not going to be on the local news. Um, and, and then I think, you know, we have to think about where these people are coming from. And so illuminating the Soros campaign to replace uh, district attorneys who are um, upholding the rule of law with district attorneys that are sabotaging them. He, has a, a, he had another project where he was doing the same thing with secretaries of state. They, they have their agenda, and they implement it. And they're very disciplined about it. And I think the problem, especially, that I've seen on the, the grassroots right is you know, once they 
understand that there's a problem, oftentimes they'll be hijacked by swamp people. Yeah. And we, we need to have some sort of immunity uh, against that. In, in a way, I almost feel like I wish there was more, there were more ways to strength, strengthen third parties and, and fourth parties. And when I lived in Washington State, at least, the Libertarian Party was, um, had a very healthy presence. They were able to make a difference. Um, and so, yeah, I know I, that's not very helpful, um, but is, is there anyone who could oppose Krasner in the, in the next election? And also, is there a recall mechanism in, in that? No. Yeah. 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 We have one more. One more. As a, uh, as a proud and practicing Catholic, <coughs> I, I don't know what kind of pushback you've gotten from bishops, but I want to I have. You. I want to applaud you for exposing the church's role in, uh, in what you have seen. Thank you, I appreciate that. I would also that. say that I think the Catholic Church is as divided as our country is. That's there are people who love this Pope, and there are others who can't stand it. And I don't know if you're sensing that or not. I am. But the Catholic Church is not uniform, I don't believe. Most of the bishops are, but not uniform in terms of at least the rank and file in terms of supporting what the church is doing yes. in facilitating illegal immigration. Yes. Um, scripture has been perverted. Uh, many of the pulpits uh, that these Catholic bishops speak from have been abused and exploited. And there, there is a growing faction, a more vocal faction of immigration enforcement and sovereignty Catholics um, who are outraged at, at what's going on. And especially outraged because it's, it's double the, the insult. Because it's not just the money that they're putting in the collection plates, it's their tax dollars uh, as well. And, um, and, and I, have been, um, I have been initiated firsthand in the power that some of these bishops can have. I spoke to a pro-life group uh, in the South, and I only mentioned in passing about the book because of the radicalization of the, the Chicago bishops who allied with Saul Alinsky, he founded something called the Industrial Areas Foundation, which laid the groundwork for the formation of the Catholic Campaign for Human Development, which is basically the social justice arm of the church uh, that supports this entire illegal alien sanctuary network. And for speaking as briefly as I just did about that in a 45-minute speech that was largely about championing the work that grassroots Catholics do to support crisis pregnancy centers, this bishop threatened the funding of the pro-life group and sacrificed, you know, how, gosh knows how many um, you know, potential clients of these crisis pregnancy centers because they elevated open borders as a, as a more important agenda item for them. That's appalling, and um, Catholics need to be aware of that, and that's why I included a whole chapter on that unholy alliance. So thank you so much. I'll stay afterwards to answer more questions. I appreciate it.